Hello everyone, and welcome to this Wednesday video kindly sponsored by Skillshare. You've probably seen or heard of them before, but just in case you haven't, Skillshare is an online learning community which contains a wide variety of skill improving classes that everyone can benefit from. If you want to learn a new skill, advance an existing one, or just see how other people happen to make things work, there'll be a video for you. Uh, for fellow naval enthusiasts such as myself, there are topics like illustration, photography, film and video, and many others. So whether you want to draw ships, photograph ships, or make videos about ships, there are tips, tricks, and techniques to discover. This month it's been helpful in two major areas. Some of you will have seen earlier this month I was bored HMS Victory reenacting the Battle of Trafalgar, and yes, Trafalgar, or Nelson Part 3, is coming later this year. And I realised I had to learn how to put some lighting up because, of course, the Great Cabin was not designed for videography, given, you know, it was built in the 18th century. So this particular course by Geordie Vanderput was quite helpful to tell me how to set up my lights. And Masuk Sakar Batista's course here on Sony Vegas, although it is for Pro 15, is also very useful as I use Vegas to make these videos and I had to do a lot more fine grain editing on this particular video that you're about to watch than I think in most of my other ones. And of course it should be helpful for some of the live footage from Victory. There are no ads on the site and if you want to go and have a look and see perhaps if there's something that you could make use of, the first thousand of you that click on the link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. So once again, thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And now, on with the show. The loss of USS Arizona during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, is perhaps the most famous and well-known element of that particular incident. And is not, as is sometimes thought, represented by this photograph. This is in fact USS Shaw exploding in a floating dry dock. Arizona's explosion, however was captured on film, albeit that the film itself is somewhat brief and appears to contain at least two gaps in its recording. But exactly what happened to Arizona has been the subject of some discussion, both during and after World War II. Now, obviously, what happened to it in the most general terms, the Ford magazines exploded, is a little bit obvious. But how that came about and what other damage the ship might have incurred before that happened is something that to a certain degree is still argued back and forth. It's not quite as contentious a topic as the destruction of HMS Hood, but nevertheless, I've been asked to look at it, so I will. Now, during the decade following her loss, the US Navy looked at least three times at how this had happened. And this, plus several damage reports, a number of correspondence items, and the seven seconds or so of film itself, have formed the basis of most historians' analysis of what might have actually happened to Arizona. And that's the roughly similar process to what we'll follow today. In the direct aftermath of Pearl Harbor, salvage work on Arizona was not considered a priority, for fairly obvious reasons, as compared to ships like the California, the Nevada, or freeing up ships like the Maryland. However, a little bit of salvage work was done, various guns were removed, and a significant quantity of ammunition, especially 14-inch projectiles, were also removed in the opening months of 1942. Now, it has to be emphasised that nobody at any point had any concept of bringing Arizona back into service. It was pretty obvious to anybody who was paying the slightest bit of attention by the end of December 7th that Arizona was never going to sail again. However... In the middle of March 1942, there were still two overall options being considered. Firstly, to construct a coffer dam around the vessel in a manner similar to the what had been done for USS West Virginia, or at that point in time what was being planned to be done for USS West Virginia, and this would allow them to cut up and scrap the forward part of the vessel, i.e. the bit that had taken the brunt of the explosion, but then everything roughly aft of the bridge, which was in slightly better condition, could in theory be patched, floated, and towed away for easier scrapping. The other option was to leave the Arizona in place, salvage what you could for reuse on other ships, and otherwise leave her where she lay. 
the latter one obviously being the path that was taken, and this was largely due to Admiral Nimitz concluding that any work to refloat Oklahoma, Utah, or Arizona would cost a huge amount of money and resources and be of very little benefit to the U.S. Navy. As it turned out, obviously, neither Utah nor Arizona would be refloated, although eventually Oklahoma would be. Now, with that said, in response to the same recommendation in the middle of March, the Bureau of Ships, well, let's just say they probably contain some of the greatest optimists on the planet at that point, because their reply reads as follows. In the case of the Arizona, this Bureau feels that the final decision as to her disposition should not be made at this time. It is felt that actual conditions in the vessel should be explored further. The magazine explosion undoubtedly caused great damage, but there was only one torpedo hit and there were several bomb hits. The magazine explosion made a shambles of the upper works forward of the smoke pipe, but the real extent and nature of this damage, so far as the structural strength of the ship is concerned, is not clear. Experience has shown that the actual reconditioning of a badly damaged vessel is much easier after she has been docked and the wreckage cleared away than appears even remotely possible when salvage operations are underway. Now, whilst they did go on to acknowledge that it was possible that any thoughts of salvage could be abandoned, I think that paragraph makes it clear that somebody who wrote that probably hadn't been to Pearl Harbor and taken a look at the ship in the first place, because as you can see, they were kind of a lone voice in the wilderness suggesting that maybe, just maybe, Arizona might not be in such a bad condition and might be able to be reconditioned, i.e. refitted for use again in service, you know, despite, as they acknowledged, the uh, forward magazine having exploded. Now, this particular debate did rattle on back and forth throughout 1942. By July, everyone on site was saying basically there was no chance of any salvage work of any significant value going on beyond that which had already been done with regards to the gun turrets. And by the end of 1942, everyone had accepted that this was pretty much going to be the case. There was a fair bit of consideration thereafter to how to therefore scrap the ship in place, or possibly by floating out the stern section. And arguments of this nature, including a bizarre proposal to refloat part or all of the ship and use it as a torpedo test rig, continued through 1943 until eventually towards the latter part of 43, everything was stopped and Arizona was left in near enough the state that she is seen in today. But conversations about what exactly to do with the wreck were running somewhat separately to the analysis of what, how the ship had actually ended up as that wreck. The first attempt at working all this out was submitted in January 1942, not quite two months after Arizona had been destroyed, and was written by Commander Alfred Homan. Amongst other reports, he wrote a pair of short notes to the Bureau of Ships talking about the damage sustained by Arizona, and what he'd been able to work out from survivors' accounts was going on on the Arizona in the minutes leading up to her destruction. Now, as a note before I read the document, obviously we know now that all of the bombers that were in the first wave were carrying 1760 pound bombs adapted from 16 inch armor piercing shells obviously on january the 28th 1942 they didn't know that so when they described the various bomb weights bear in mind that that's their best estimation and what we're actually talking about are the adapted 16 inch ap shells the document reads as follows the USS Arizona, insofar as can be determined, sustained eight bomb hits and one torpedo hit, which completely destroyed the ship forward of frame 88 by fire and explosion of forward magazines, the fire being finally extinguished after burning two days. It is believed that considerable equipment aft of frame 90 can eventually be salvaged. Detailed information, as required by reference C, is as follows. General, all battle damage. The USS Arizona was moored at berth Fox 7, Pearl Harbor, in seven and a half fathoms of water when the attack took place at 7.55, December 7th, 1941. The draft before the attack was approximately as follows. Forward, 32 feet, 6 inches, and aft, 33 feet. Bomb hits. 1. 
One 500-pound bomb hit the faceplate of number 4 turret on the starboard side, glanced off and passed through the deck at frame 123, starboard side of the quarterdeck, between the captain's hatch and the number 4 turret, and exploded in the captain's pantry, destroying the captain's pantry and the admiral's pantry. A small fire started, which apparently burned itself out in a short time. 2. One 500-pound bomb hit the ship at frame 85, port gallery deck. Width of hole in the deck is about 24 inches in diameter. Depth of penetration is not known. 3. One 500-pound or 1,000-pound bomb hit at frame 96, port side of the quarter deck, in MB stowage. Depth of penetration is not known. Width of hole in deck is approximately 24 inches. 4. One bomb, approximately 1,000 pounds, hit on the boat deck just forward of stack, frame 67. Width of hole on boat deck is approximately 4 feet. Depth of penetration is not known. 5. One heavy bomb, approximately 1,000 or 2,000 pound, went down the stack. Extent of damage is not known. 6. One bomb hit, size of bomb not known, on boat deck at frame 66, port side by number 4 anti-aircraft gun ammunition hoist. Extent of damage done by this bomb is not known. 7. One heavy bomb hit, estimated over 1,000 pound armor piercing bomb, hit Foxel by number 2 turret, which it is believed penetrated to the black powder magazines, setting off the smokeless powder magazines adjacent, and causing the explosion which destroyed the ship forward. From the report of the commanding officer of the USS Vestal, which was moored alongside the Arizona, to port, bow to stern, the Arizona apparently sustained a torpedo hit about frame 35, port side. Damage caused by this torpedo hit cannot be determined, as the ship in this area has been completely destroyed. The outboard fuel oil tanks were filled to 95% capacity in the area of the possible torpedo hit. The ship at the start of the attack was in material condition X-ray with usual watertight doors closed below the third deck except airports above the water line were open. Material condition Z had been partially set during the action before the ship was destroyed. The after magazines were voluntarily flooded during the attack. So there are four key bits of information from this report apart from the fact, obviously, that they didn't know about the 1,760-pound bombs and were attributing it to 500,000-pound or occasionally 2,000-pound bombs. Firstly, Arizona had actually sustained quite a number of bomb hits, which is important to any analysis of what might have happened to Arizona had she not taken that magazine hit. But while some of that deeper damage couldn't be quantified because of the subsequent larger explosion disrupting any effort to reach that area or indeed probably destroying parts of that area by itself, it has to be said that until that bomb hit to the magazines, Arizona doesn't appear to have sustained any damage that would render her incapable of being refitted. Certainly she wasn't in anywhere near as bad a shape as something like West Virginia. The second item to note is that at the time they thought that a bomb had gone down the stack, and we'll see why they thought that a little bit later on. Thirdly, they thought that she had been torpedoed at least once due to the report of USS Vestal. Although, as we'll see later, subsequent examination proved that this wasn't the case. And finally, we have the first estimate as to why the magazine exploded. Specifically, that this bomb penetrates the black powder magazine, which sets off the smokeless powder magazine, which is the main magazine, if you like, which then causes the overall explosion. Now, the reason that the Arizona was carrying black powder as well as smokeless powder at the time was because when it came to the charges that propelled her shells downrange, at least for the 14-inch guns, back when she'd been built, she used smokeless powder as the main charge, but this is somewhat difficult to persuade to explode, and so black powder is used as a detonator or initiator or whatever you want to call it, but basically to set off the main charge. Now, in later warships... And if any of you go on a museum ship tour of a North Carolina, South Dakota, or Iowa-class battleship, you'll notice that the detonator charge, the primer charge, if you like, is integrated into the main charge itself. But in older ships, this wasn't always the case. There were plans to change their charges over to this, but originally, the black powder charge was separate to the main charges, and because the black powder was a lot more sensitive it was stored in a separate area of the magazines but as i said more on that later the other report that we alluded to from january 28th 1942 was regarding the damage control so that reads as follows 
Information regarding the conditions during and after the air attacks of December 7, 1941, required by letter paragraphs in reference A, a circular letter providing information to many recipients, is submitted as follows. 1. The only information available concerning the material condition at the time of the attack is taken from the statements of the few survivors that were aboard during the raid. Exploratory work has, to date, been limited to the main and second decks aft and does not include the more vital parts of the ship. Some conclusions can be drawn from the known habits and practices of the crew. 2. All X doors and fittings, with few exceptions, were closed at this early hour, 0755, on a Sunday morning. Many Y doors and fittings were also still closed from the previous night. Many of the engineering spaces, those not actually in use, were in condition Z and locked. This included the shaft alleys, engine rooms, fire rooms, but not the dynamos, evaporators and ice machines. D Part 1. This attack was so sudden that little time was allowed for setting condition Z before the forward magazines exploded and completely demolished the whole ship forward of frame 88. D Part 2. From statements of survivors, it is believed that material condition Z was nearly set in turrets 3 and 4, but not completely set. There were no survivors from turrets 1 and 2, but there is no reason to believe that they were not also in condition Z, or very nearly so. D Part 3. There is good reason to believe that the boiler division and B part of the ship below the third deck was probably in condition Z shortly after the attack began and probably before the one bomb was observed going down the stack. D part 4. From experiencing setting condition Z, statements of the survivors and exploratory work so far, it is fairly certain that condition Z was not completely set on the third deck and probably most of the third deck armoured hatches were still open. This can be further amplified as salvage work progresses. The total destruction of the forward part of the ship will make it difficult to get positive information concerning this part of the ship. E. Shortly after the attack began, probably 15 minutes, the forward magazines exploded and all further efforts to close up the ship were fruitless. F. Complete destruction with no survivors from many positions of the ship make it difficult to determine the effectiveness of the watertight compartmentation. The ship settled for several days, and escaping air was observed in many areas which might indicate that some spaces were slow in flooding. Statements of survivors would, however, indicate that the flooding was general after the magazine explosion. Water filled turret 4 at a very rapid rate, and this would not have been the case if Z were completely set. Some doors aft could have been ruptured by a bomb which hit turret 4 on the side plate, but there is no positive evidence as yet. G. No information available. H. Many fires were started by the bomb hits, and the whole forward part of the ship was set ablaze after the magazine explosion. The decks burned readily, and lots of floating oil increased the fire. I. The wind in carried the smoke forward of a, in a black cloud, obscuring everything forward. Fumes and yellow smoke issued from some, for some time from the bomb holes. J, K, L, and M. An early bomb hit down the stack disrupted the main fire main and bilge pumps, and there was no water with which to fight the fires. CO2 was used on the quarterdeck to stem small fires, but the general conflagration forward was completely out of hand. There was no opportunity to observe the effectiveness of the firefighting equipment. N. The early destruction of the engineering spaces took all power, light and telephone services from the ship. O. Flashlights were used effectively in the turrets, but the supply was not adequate to meet the emergency and P. Many men were badly burned, even to death, by the blast from the magazines. Flashproof clothes might have minimised these losses. So we can see here that a few things are attributed to this supposed bomb down the stack, which as we'll see later on didn't actually happen, but overall they don't contribute materially to how the ship was lost. Uh, to be honest, by the time the magazine sets off, as it notes in another section, everything in the engineering spaces was dead and broken anyway, so firefighting equipment wouldn't have been of any use whatever the case now as far as those x y and z terms that are contained in this report for obviously for those of you in who are either in the u.s navy or have been in the u.s navy you'll know exactly what they mean for those of you who might not um, condition x is the way the ship is set up when the ship is not in any danger of attack or any natural hazards uh, the, there are various doors within a ship and at they should be marked with an X, Y, or Z. So during condition X, i.e. normal procedure in peacetime, doors with an X should remain closed, but doors with a Y or Z can be open. Condition Y 
is set when the ship is either at sea, entering or leaving a port, or in port and could potentially get underway. So it's an additional level. So at that point, all doors with an X or a Y should remain closed when not in use. And then condition Z involves closing all the doors marked X, Y or Z. And condition Z is specified as what you need to set during general quarters, when you have shipwide casualties, when entering or leaving a port during wartime, or any time the ship is in danger against fire, flooding, or other damage. So effectively what the report is saying is that in terms of its ability to resist incoming damage, the Arizona was most of the way to being fully ready for receiving that damage, i.e. almost at condition Z, but not quite. She was partway between Y and Z at the time of the detonation, and based on the reports from everywhere else in the ship where there were survivors, there's no particular reason to assume that the forward portion of the ship had been any further advanced in that process. So they would have had some Condition Z doors shut, but perhaps not all. So that's what the US Navy thought at the beginning of 1942. One of the things that we mentioned is that Black Powder magazine, and you know, some people have said, oh, well, actually, no, Arizona would have been using the newer design charges where the Black Powder bags are part of the charge rather than separate. And so this detonation of the Black Powder magazines couldn't have happened. But this is flatly contradicted by the US Navy's own investigations in 1943, because following the initial analysis, which we've just looked at in 1942, a much deeper analysis was undertaken in 1943, at least in terms of evaluating what exactly had been on the ship and therefore what might have happened. The request for this analysis was made in early summer and the report was delivered in October 1943, submitted by one Captain R. W. Payne. Now the first three sections of the report detail the efforts made by divers and where they went and what conditions they faced and so forth and whilst interesting reading they are not relevant particularly to what we're looking at which is the damage and the cause of the loss so we're going to pick up this particular narrative at section four part a Due to the structural damage and debris in the forward part of the ship, it has been impractical to determine the path of entry of the bomb that is reported in reference B to have struck the ship near turret 2. It appears probable, due to the greater structural damage forward of turret 1, especially on the port side, that the bomb may have penetrated on the port side of turret 1. B. It is believed from conversations with personnel that were attached to the ship at the time and the contents of the forward magazines prior to the attack on December 7th, 1941, that they contained as follows. 1. 308 14-inch shells in each turret, numbers 1 and 2, on turret shell decks and in handling rooms on the first platform. 2. 616 cans of smokeless powder for each turret, numbers 1 and 2, distributed in six accommodating magazines, A424M, A420M, A414M, A413M, A421M and A423M on the first platform. 3. 25 25 pound cans and 150 number 3 charges of black powder between numbers 1 and 2 turrets in the black powder magazine A415M on the first platform. 3,500 cans of 5 inch 51 calibre smokeless powder in the 5 inch powder magazines forward, powder about equally distributed between the magazines on the first and second platforms A423M, A431M and A324M. 5. Approximately 300,000 rounds of 50 caliber anti-aircraft ammunition in forward 50 caliber magazine A408M. 6. Approximately 3,500 5 inch 51 caliber projectiles in ammunition passages amidships B504M and B505M on the third deck. 7. Small arms ammunition, approximately 100,000 rounds of 30 calibre, 5,000 rounds of 45 calibre and 1,000 service primers in A417M on the first platform. 8. 75 14 inch primers in each turret, numbers 1 and 2 in the gun chamber. And 9. 50 electrical detonators in trunk A511-2-T on the third deck. So briefly interrupting here. What Captain Payne had done is he talked to the survivors, he'd looked at what the manifests for the ship said in the immediate run-up to December 7th, and he had deduced that, in fact, the magazine A415M did contain 
but quite a significant quantity of black powder. Just the £25 cans present amounted to about a third of a tonne of gunpowder, to say nothing of the 150-odd number 3 charges. Resuming the report, Section C, it appears that the explosion in the forward magazines was vented through the sides of the ship from about frame 10 to about frame 70 and went upward through the decks forward of turret number 1. Due to the general extent of interior damage between frames 10 and 70, it is difficult to determine the exact magazines in which high-order detonation took place, although the most severe damage is between frames 10 and 33. D. The following remnants of ammunition were found on, or in, the vicinity of the ship. Uh, D. Part 1. Unburned 14-inch powder grains were found on the quarter deck of the USS Tennessee, moored at berth F6 forward of USS Arizona, a distance of approximately 400 feet. On Ford Island, approximately 500 feet from the shoreline, or a total distance of approximately 900 feet from the ship, over the unburned portions of the Arizona and in the mud and wreckage in and around the ship. D. Part 2. A 14-inch powder can was found in the bottom of the conning tower tube above the hatch opening. D. Part 3. Exploded 5-inch 51 caliber powder cans were found along the beach on Ford Island, a distance of 350 to 400 feet, on top of the forward key F7S, to which the ship was moored, and in the mud around the sides of the ship. And D. Part 4. Unexploded 5-inch 51 caliber projectiles were found in the mud over the starboard side opposite frames 54 and to 65, and in the aft portion of compartments B504M and B505M. E. No intact ammunition has been recovered from the forward part of the ship. Part 5. As requested in paragraph 1E of reference A, enclosures 1, 2 and 3 are forwarded to indicate the major damage resulting from the bomb hits and the subsequent explosion of the forward magazines. The following supplementary information relative to the damage is furnished from divers' reports, proceeding generally from the aft forward. A. Except for the interior damage indicated on enclosure 2, the ship aft of frame 78 is essentially intact. B. No evidence of torpedo hits has been found, although the condition of the flat of the bottom forward inboard of the areas searched, as described in paragraph 2a, is not known. The bottom structure in the forward part of the ship is not accessible from inside and is embedded in the mud outside. C. The armour belt and blister are essentially in place except for the damage indicated on enclosure 2. D. In connection with the interior diving listed in paragraph 2b above, because of the wreckage the divers were not able to penetrate further forward than frame 76 on the main and second decks and not forward of bulkhead 78 below the third deck. However, on the third deck in ammunition passageways A504M and A505M, access was possible as far forward as frame 66. In these spaces, the second deck sloped down, sloped down forward, and the third deck was split and blown upward generally. No access could be gained to the fireman's passage, C501, on the third deck. E. Beginning at about frame 62, port and starboard, the sides of the ship from the top of the armour to the upper deck began to bulge outward, and proceeding forward, this bulging and tearing away from the internal structure is increased, so that between frames 50 and 10, the sides were blown outward almost to a horizontal position, with portions of the upper and main decks attached in some areas between frames 34 and 10. F. The decks have collapsed and sloped downward from about frame 70 forward to about frame 34. Between frames 45 and 34, the upper deck is about 3 feet below the top of the armour on the starboard side, and approximately at the top of the armour on the port side. G. Divers located, but due to wreckage below were unable to enter, the hatch at frame 41 on the starboard side of the upper deck. They were able to reach the second deck through the corresponding hatch on the port side, but could not leave the immediate vicinity on either the main or second deck due to wreckage and floating lumber. H. The uptake armour, conning tower and armour tube, and turrets number 1 and number 2, have dropped from their normal positions, as indicated on enclosure 2. I. The uptake armour grating in the main deck was examined as far as the wreckage of the uptakes would permit, and is believed to be intact. J. The wreckage below the hatch in the bottom of the conning tower armour tube prevented the diver from leaving the immediate vicinity. Access to the hatch was gained down the inside of the tube after removal of the conning tower. K. No damage was found in the gun chamber and gun pit in turret 2 where they, when they were unwatered by pumping in connection with the removal of the guns, slides and related equipment. 
L, the upper deck between frames 10 and 34, including wildcats and shafts, was rolled forward and otherwise blown out as indicated on Enclosure 2. Portions of the main and second decks from about frames 10 to 20 were blown forward with the upper deck. Otherwise, due to the poor underwater visibility, it has not been practicable to identify the various structural members. What appears to be a portion of the second deck plating is about 8 foot below the top of the armour on the starboard side, and on the port side, the general level of the wreckage is considerably lower. At the centre line, at the forward edge of number 1 barbette, the level of the wreckage is about 28 feet below the top of the barbette. The worm and wheel assemblies for the starboard and centre windlasses were found still bolted to a portion of the third deck, and the port assembly was missing. Now, apart from the rather dry description of the horrific damage in the forward part of the Arizona, there are three main takeaways from this. One, there was no evidence of a torpedo hit. In fact, it appears that was probably a near miss from a bomb dropped at the same time, or near enough at the same time as the bomb that actually destroyed the Arizona, and it just landed so close to the Arizona that people in the Vestal thought it was a torpedo striking the ship. Secondly, the grating, bearing in mind that before they thought a bomb had gone down the funnel, was examined and found to be intact, so there was no bomb down the funnel and into the engine spaces. And third, generally speaking, there appears to be somewhat more damage to the port side of the ship than the starboard, which indicates that perhaps the explosion was more intense on that side and therefore potentially started on that side. Another interesting note, although not a primary one, is the nature of the unexploded ordnance discovered. The fact that a fair number of unexploded 5-inch projectiles and powder cans were found was a fairly clear indication that whilst some of that might have exploded, it probably wasn't the 5-inch magazines which were the origin point of the big explosion. And secondly, various bits of unburnt 14-inch smokeless powder being found gave a potential hint that maybe the 14-inch smokeless magazine hadn't been, again, the primary initiator, which did tend to square somewhat with the previous report, which pointed to the 15-inch black powder magazines as the primary culprits. Although at the same time, the extreme volatility of black powder as compared to the smokeless powder would mean that even if the smokeless powder magazines had gone up first, there probably wouldn't be any traces of the black powder magazine contents locatable anyway. Now, that brings us up to late 1944, when Commander E.C. Holtzworth submits the analysis of loss of Arizona on the 31st of October. During this report, he makes reference to a film, the film of Arizona being destroyed. Now, the film, as you'll find on the U.S. National Archives, is playing above you at the moment albeit in slow motion. Now, the one thing you'll realise is Vestal is on the outside of Arizona, and therefore this is being taken from the Ford Island side of Arizona, although not necessarily on Ford Island itself, which means the alignment is completely wrong. For whatever reason, when this was digitised, it was digitised horizontally flipped. And so in this video, I've flipped this particular bit of film to show the correct orientation, and this is what we'll be using to refer to from now on. Now, one note, they make reference in this report and in a subsequent one we're going to read to various frames of footage. Now, I'm going to try and match as best I can, but obviously they had access to the individual celluloid frames, so they can make very precise estimates, whereas with digital I can only advance step by step and hope that I've got approximately the right frame. So... If there are any minor errors, they are entirely my own. Now, in this report, sections 1 and 2 are basically scene setting, telling the reader where Arizona was, and that it was partly between condition Y and condition Z, but we're going to skip those again for obvious reasons. So starting at part 3, it says the attack started at 0755 with dive bombers over the naval air station on Ford Island. At this time, the measures referred to in paragraph 2 were started. This is going from condition Y to condition Z. Almost simultaneously, a torpedo attack on battleship row occurred. The commanding officer of Vestal, in reference E, stated that about 08 to 20, a torpedo was seen to pass astern of the Vestal, and this torpedo apparently hit the Arizona, whose bow extended almost 100 feet beyond the stern of Vestal. 
He further states that the Arizona received a bomb hit forward almost simultaneously and that Arizona's forward magazine exploded. Reference B lists eight bomb hits on the vessel, one of which apparently was large and of the armor piercing type, reference B being the 1942 analysis. This one was reported by reference B to have hit the forecastle by number two turret. In any event, the magazine explosion destroyed the ship almost completely forward of the foremast structure. Part four. Reference A found evidence of only five bomb hits, all of which were aft of the foremast structure. At the same time, the ship was so seriously broken up forward of the foremast structure that evidence of a heavy bomb hit in the vicinity of turret 2 would be certain to have been completely obliterated. On the other hand, the armour belt was substantially intact and Pearl Harbor found absolutely no evidence of a torpedo hit in or just below the armour. It can therefore be accepted as a fact that a torpedo did not hit Arizona times in all the references of the various sequences of events check reasonably well that is within four or five minutes it appears that arizona escaped torpedo damage during the initial torpedo attack which occurred at about 0800 it will be recalled that nevada was hit by a torpedo between 0800 and 0810 and that west virginia was torpedoed at about the same time following this attack the dive bombing attack on the battleship started it was actually kate's level bombing but never mind this was about 0815 to 0820 all the references agree that the bombs which struck Arizona fell between 0815 and 0820. For example, it appears that West Virginia was struck by bombs at about this time, as was Tennessee. It appears that the dive bombing continued from about 0810 to 0830 in this phase of the attack. Reference F, of which a 3-inch by 5-inch movie strip is available, comprises about 400 pictures taken at the rate of 24 per second. The location of the camera in these pictures apparently was a point on the northwest shore of Kau, Ka, I think Kauhua, Kauhua Island, sorry, um, where a supply base was under construction at the time. The precise location cannot be determined, but the general location can be spotted on a map of Pearl Harbor, which is also available. The first 45 of these pictures show the Arizona and Vestal and include the bow of Nevada and the stern of West Virginia. There seems to be no damage to Arizona in these pictures, but evidence of the fire on Vestal's forecastle, she was struck by a bomb apparently prior to 0820, is faintly visible. West Virginia's mainmast is also in these pictures and shows a definite list indicating that West Virginia had already been torpedoed prior to the pictures. This is consistent with the times reported. Picture 46 definitely shows an explosion on the bow of Arizona. It is estimated that picture 46 was taken within 0.5 seconds of the detonation. As the pictures proceed, the fire gets worse, finally engulfing the entire ship forward of the mainmast. This series continues until picture 208. Between pictures 46 and 208, the development of a jet of black smoke from Arizona's stack can be noted. It is this jet of black smoke which apparently gave rise to the rumour that a bomb went down her stack. Actually, Pearl Harbor could find no damage to the armour gratings, although there was bomb damage both forward and port of the uptakes. These bombs unquestionably damaged the intakes in the steaming fire room, not identified, although some evidence indicates that number six was in use. The smoke issuing from the stack was quite obviously the result of incomplete combustion rather than an explosion or fire. Beginning with the pictures in the vicinity of 106, the characteristics and the, of the conflagration shown are somewhat similar to those of an oil fire. At various places between pictures 46 and 208, minor explosions on the forecastle of Arizona and possibly on the stern of Tennessee can be seen. In this connection, see pictures 99 and 136. Picture 208 definitely shows the magazine explosion in which the dense black smoke of the previous picture changes to white and luminous objects can be seen. Toward the end of the reel, the sagged forward superstructure becomes apparent, although the smoke and flame obscure the entire foremast structure in the series of pictures following 208. Picture 208 occurred approximately 7 seconds, 24 frames per second, after the detonation shown in picture 46. There is no evidence the camera was stopped at any time between pictures 46 and 208. The above evidence leads to the conclusion that there was a bomb detonation on or about the forecastle, which caused a bad fire involving some manner of oil from tanks forward of amidships. This fire spread rapidly over a large area and increased rapidly in intensity. It was followed in 7 seconds by a magazine explosion. In examining the causes of the magazine explosions, characteristics of smokeless powder and black powder were investigated. Pertinent information from the Ordnance Safety Manual, published in 1st of September 1941 by the Ordnance Office of the Chief of Ordnance, U.S. Army, are quoted below. Small amounts of unconfined smokeless powder burn with little smoke or ash and without explosion. 
When confined or in large quantities, the rate of burning increases with the temperature and pressure. Under certain conditions, with sufficient initiation, smokeless powder has been known to detonate. When smokeless powder is stored in magazines, in containers or propelling charges, there is no evidence to indicate that fires will give rise to any unusual hazard. Cases in which pressures great enough to result in structural damage have occurred involve the burning or explosion of smokeless powder under circumstances not ordinarily encountered in the storage of the material and containers. There is, however, incontrovertible evidence that explosions of nitrocellulose powders up to large sizes are capable of being propagated from box to box when they're initiated by the detonation of high explosive charges. It can be concluded from the above conditions that smokeless powder is difficult to detonate as a result of fire. It is also certain that with sufficient initiation, smokeless powder will detonate. With respect to the properties of black powder, the following pertinent information is quoted from the same manual. Black powder is regarded as one of the worst known explosive hazards. When ignited unconfined, it burns with explosive violence and will explode if ignited under even slight confinement. It can be ignited easily by very small sparks, heat and friction. Most black powder fires start from sparks, and ignition results in an explosion so quickly that no attempt can be made to fight the fire. Most explosions of black powder originate from sparks, and loose black powder is extremely dangerous. It can be seen from the above that the ignition of black powder will almost inevitably result in an explosion. From reference A, the Arizona had on board her a full allowance of smokeless powder arranged in three magazines on each side of the vessel between frames 31 and 48 on the first platform. These six magazines supply both turrets 1 and 2. The black powder magazine is located on the first platform on the centre line between frames 37 and 39. It contained 1,075 pounds of black powder. It will be realised that the black powder magazine is surrounded by the smokeless powder magazines. After the magazine explosion occurred, Reference A reports that exploded 5-inch 51 caliber powder cans were found along the beach on Ford Island, a distance of 350 to 400 feet from the starboard side of the vessel. The 5-inch 51 caliber powder magazines are located on the first platform after the 14-inch smokeless powder magazines between frames 50 and 58, port and starboard. There is no doubt that the smokeless powder magazines detonated. It is not clear, however, what initiated the smokeless powder detonation. A bomb detonation within the smokeless powder magazine presumably could cause a detonation, although smokeless powder as such is not an unusually severe hazard. The Army's experience indicates that it is difficult to detonate smokeless powder as a result of a fire unless confinement, temperature, pressure and high density of loading are present. Our own war experience has indicated that an appreciable interval of time, longer than seven seconds, is required for these factors to build up and create a mass detonation following a fire. A fire could reach the magazines through hatches left open on the third deck. There are five such hatches in the vicinity of barbettes 1 and 2, one of which is almost directly above the black powder magazine. It is a possibility that one of the modified 16-inch armour-piercing projectiles, which the Japanese use for bombs, might have penetrated the 4-inch STS armoured deck and initiated a fire followed by detonation of the smokeless powder magazines. This seems rather improbable, though, considering the small charge of explosive, less than 70 pounds of TNT, in this type of bomb, and the fact, pictures 46 through 208, that the initial fire was definitely above the waterline and of a large-scale proportion. On the other hand, the detonation of 1,000 pounds of black powder could easily initiate a detonation of the 14-inch smokeless powder. The black powder could have detonated either as the result of a bomb detonation below the third deck or a fire above the third deck passing down to the black powder magazines through open hatches in the armoured deck. From the evidence, it is believed the latter is more probable. In any event, the six 14-inch and two 5-inch smokeless powder magazines detonated. The collapse of the foremast structure was not due, amongst other curious things, to the main magazine detonation. A bomb which hit and detonated close to the port leg of the tripod at the superstructure deck level severed the port leg, and the starboard leg was insufficient to prevent forward collapse. Turret 1, with its barbette, fell vertically approximately 22 feet, and turret 2, with its barbette, fell approximately 23 feet. All other structure above the top edge of the side armour between frames 10 and 70 was completely demolished. In fact, most of it was missing. The armour belt remained substantially in place. There were short pieces of the shell projecting almost horizontally outward at the top of the armour belt on both sides. Summarising, there seems to be no doubt that at least one bomb struck and penetrated the forecastle deck in the vicinity of either turret 1 or turret 2. Uh, 
This bomb, and possibly others, caused an intense fire which shortly covered the entire forecastle. Oil on the surface of the water was ignited. Approximately seven seconds after the start of this fire and after the initial bomb detonation, the main magazines exploded, almost completely destroying the ship forward of frame 70. Undoubtedly, the smokeless powder magazines detonated en masse. Whether this mass detonation resulted from a bomb detonation either within either the smokeless powder or black powder magazines, or whether it was initiated by fire travelling through down through open hatches to the black powder magazine is unknown, but the time involved between the first bomb detonation and the detonation of the main magazines, approximately seven seconds, and the visible intense fire above the waterline makes the latter supposition more reasonable. When opportunity permits, this case will be discussed with representatives of the Bureau of Ordnance. With that said, there are a couple of issues with this report. As was pointed out in the article, The US Navy Study of the Loss of the Battleship Arizona by Chris Wright and Bill Jurens, which was published in Warship International, Volume 39, Number 3, in 2002, um, they point out that a recent review of paragraph 14 above, which is about the collapse of the uh, main ma of the foremast, sorry, uh, indicates a full explanation for the collapse forward of the foremast and superstructure. The armoured conning tower and tube together weighed about 400 tonnes and were rigidly attached to the superstructure decks. Study of damage photographs shows that the conning tower dropped vertically after the supporting bulkheads underneath were blown away. The weight of the armoured conning tower pulled the superstructure down with it, with the tripod mast following. All the superstructure aft of the tower tipped forward because that structure remained attached at its back end as the forward structure fell downwards. In turn, the two bridge levels above the conning tower, together about 15 feet high, collapsed into a space roughly 6 feet high above the conning tower. These two deck levels comprised the Admiral's Bridge and the Pilot House. The main vertical leg of the forward tripod mast was fully capable of supporting the control tops above. This main mast incorporated an internal vertical access trunk as well as cabling runs for the gunfire control systems in the tops, and thus also was larger than it needed to be solely for structural support purposes. The side legs were added to prevent the main leg from collapsing sideways due to the ship rolling motion, or to a lesser extent to prevent it from collapsing forward or aft due to pitching loads. Thus, damage to one of the lateral supporting mast legs did not cause the foremast to fall forward. The mast system remained substantially intact as it fell forward, despite the severe whipping motion incurred in the forward tripod mast immediately following the main forward magazine conflagration. There is also some contradiction in the report as it attributes some of the fire to oil tanks breached in the ship, but also potentially that the bomb doesn't reach the magazines and that fire spreads from above down through hatches. Now whether those hatches were open or not, exactly how far along the ship was to be in condition Z, obviously as mentioned earlier we don't know, but if the bomb didn't penetrate the armor deck above and started a fire which spread through the hatches then it couldn't have set off the oil which was in tanks which were even further down in the ship conversely if the oil tanks were set on fire that would suggest the bomb had actually gone through pretty much all of the ship and detonated in the oil tanks or close to them so there is a little bit of inconsistency there now, the final piece of evidence from the US Navy's analysis that we're going to look at is a memorandum that was filed in November 1947 by Commander Menifi, I think that's how you pronounce his name anyway, and once again, uh, there's some scene setting in the initial paragraphs which we're going to skip. So we pick up with, in the first 45 pictures, there is no apparent damage to Arizona. However, there is some evidence that she may have already been hit by bombs. Just forward of turret 1, smoke is visible, and at the foot of the forward king post on Vestal, there is some evidence of smoke. Just off Arizona's bow and in line with West Virginia is a white wisp on the water, which may be spray from a bomb near Miss. West Virginia has already taken a considerable port list. Smoke from the fire on West Virginia is very apparent. Between pictures 45 and 46, there was an indefinite period of time. This period of time is indicated by the hand that appears on the right side of picture 46, the disappearance of the obstruction on the left side of the pictures, the movement of the piling at the stern of the tug at the foreground relative to Vestal, and the appearance of smoke from Vestal's smokestack. Tennessee appears in picture 46 for the first time, while West Virginia is practically obscured by the fire at Arizona's bow. Picture 46 definitely shows an explosion on the bow of Arizona. The flame appears to be just as high as the mast and very little smoke is associated with the flame. In picture 53, 
black smoke is just starting to rise vertically out of Arizona's stack. Between pictures 53 and 110, the black smoke from the stack rises vertically to a height about three times that of the foremast in about two and a half seconds. The effect is believed to be similar to that noted at Crossroads, the 1946 atomic bomb experiments with ship targets, after test A when soot was shaken loose and drawn out of the stacks of dead ships. If so, it is evidence that picture 46 was taken very soon after the explosion on the bow of Arizona and that this explosion was of considerable magnitude. The report then goes on to look at various details in specific frames, but we pick it up again at paragraph 15. The evidence is not clear as to whether the bomb penetrated the third deck or a fire started by the bomb detonation passed through an open hatch in the third deck into the magazines. Reference A stated that most of the armoured hatches on the main deck were probably open at the time, and reference A indicated that fragments of four of five bombs, of which definite evidence was found, having hit Arizona, penetrated the third deck. The fifth bomb hit the faceplate of turret four, which may account for its detonation above the second deck. It appears that there was an interval of several seconds between the bomb hit and the magazine explosion. In the statement of Ensign Heim, reference A noted that the quartermaster had time to report the bomb hit on turret 2 before the magazine explosion. The shaking of the ship is definite evidence of a magazine explosion rather than the detonation of an armour-piercing bomb. From the known characteristics of smokeless and black powder enumerated in paragraph 10 of reference A, it is believed that the 1,075 pounds of black powder in magazine A415M detonated. It is believed that this detonation is shown in picture 46. Ensign Heim reported that he was able to leave the bridge after the magazine explosion and make his way down to the foremast superstructure to the quarterdeck. This would have been impossible through the fire shown in picture 208. The smoke that rapidly rose out of the stack beginning at picture 40, 53 is evidence of an explosion of major proportions. Very shortly after the explosion of the black powder, a fire started in one of the smokeless powder magazines. Evidence of this fire is seen on the forward side of the fire beginning at picture 61. Pictures 99 through 1 and 40 indicate further development of this fire. By picture 160, the fire appears to have become stabilised and remains so through to picture 207, a period of about two seconds. After an interval of indefinite length, picture 208 shows the smokeless powder fire after it had spread throughout the smokeless powder magazine. It is noted that some evidence of a time interval between the bomb detonation and initiation of the magazine explosion. There is very definite evidence of a period of over seven seconds between the initiation of the magazine explosion shown in picture 46 and the general conflagration of the smokeless powder shown in picture 208. These time intervals suggest that if an automatic sprinkling magazine sprinkling apparatus had been installed, the magazine explosion might have been avoided, or after the magazine explosion, the spread of the fire to the smokeless powder might have been controlled. Now, this report, when it couples with the other reports, does contain a few bits of key information. Firstly, it points out that out of the other bomb hits which could be accounted for in the aft part of Arizona, four out of five of them did manage to penetrate the armour deck. The only one that didn't was one that had ricocheted off a turret face, so, you know, had already lost a bunch of energy and possibly even its armour-piercing cap. So it would appear that, generally speaking, the heavy bombs that the Japanese were using were capable of going through the armour deck. This would tend to rule out the 1944 suggestion that perhaps the bomb detonated above there started a fire and this fire spread down into the magazines because there's no indication that the bomb hit anything like a turret faceplate on the way down and so in common with every other bomb that hit the deck directly it should have gone through which then indicates that this bomb would have fetched up in the magazines. So whilst of course it cannot be definitively proven one way or the other thanks to the lack of existence of most of the part of Arizona that you need to prove it, it would appear that the most plausible scenario for the destruction of the Arizona is that a adapted 16-inch armor-piercing shell turned into a bomb is dropped, it hits the Arizona in the vicinity of the forward turrets, goes down to the level of the armor deck, penetrates that armor deck, and fetches up deep in the ship. Now, because it's obviously been dropped at a slight angle, not perfectly vertical, this allows it to travel a little bit compared to its point of impact. And most likely, this bomb either fetches up in or very close to the black powder magazine. Its detonation sets off the just over 1,000 pounds of black powder contained within said magazine, 
And the force of this detonation both starts all the soot built up in the funnel, hence you get the plume of soot coming out of the uh, funnel of the Arizona, and also starts a sympathetic detonation of some of the smokeless powder in the rest of the ship's magazines. There is a slight delay in all of this occurring, and so what you get in the film is you actually see what's effectively two magazine detonations. You have the initial surge, which is the black powder detonation, followed shortly thereafter, as the effect spreads, by the detonation of the smokeless powder. This chucks more smokeless powder, because it's not complete detonation, out, and you see some of it exploding on nearby ships, some of it landing on other nearby ships, and some of it landing on the island, etc., as described in the previous reports. And as the ship is opened up by the explosion, what's left of the smokeless powder by this point continues to burn or deflagrate at this point because it's no longer confined, and that contributes to an ongoing fairly intense fire that over the course of a few seconds will gradually die down because this is a fairly energetic deflagration and leave you with the more general fires that have left on the ship and as that happens obviously a good chunk of the ship's bow ceases to exist the explosion is somewhat directed by the mostly intact armor deck above it and the weight of the turrets and the barbettes and obviously the fact that there's quite a lot of armor there as well which is why the fire ball tends to jet out of the bow of Arizona as well as up and around and because of the cessation of existence of a good chunk of the Arizona's bow the heavy stuff that's above it the conning tower the superstructure etc collapses down into the void along with the turrets and barbettes and this drags down the foremast which results in the rather famous pictures that are seen in the immediate aftermath of the sinking of the Arizona. So that sums up what is the most likely sequence of events for the destruction of USS Arizona and how the US Navy arrived at it. As for the big question of whether or not this would have occurred had that black powder magazine not been there, i.e. had Arizona moved over to the newer types of charges, well, it's not entirely possible to prove without full-scale experiment. On the one hand, you wouldn't have the sheer concentration of black powder that you had on Arizona, on the other hand, if the bomb is fetching up in a conventional smokeless powder magazine and each of the charges there has its own integrated black powder uh, primer, then it's anyone's guess as to whether you'll get a slow deflagration of some of the charges or whether the force of the bomb would actually set off the primer patches within the smokeless powder charges, which would then set off the smokeless powder charges as if they were in a gun barrel which would then set off the magazine anyway, you'd get a slightly different explosion, a more continuous one rather than a two-stage one that you've got with Arizona. But whether or not that would destroy the ship, whether or not it would occur at all, fortunately, no one on a US fast battleship has ever been in a position to find out. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.